Hey everyone, welcome to the 54th online Spintronic seminar. It's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Uh, Dr. Carlos Rojas Sanchez is a CNRS researcher at the Young Lemoore Institute, the, Univers the University of Lorraine and the CNRS in Nancy, France. Carlos studied physics at the National University of Engineering in Lima, Peru. Carlos then pursued his master's and doctoral studies in physics at the uh, Barcelo Institute in Bariloche, Argentina. From 2011 to 2015, he was a postdoc fellow at uh, Spintech Sierra Grenoble, Neo Institute, and UMP CNI Stales in France. In 2015, he achieved a permanent position as a CNI's researcher. He received the award, uh, he received the CNI's bronze medal in 2020. So without further ado, Carlos, please go ahead with your talk. Thank you very much, Infan, for a nice introduction, and thanks again to you and Kirill for this great idea and for your kind invitation. So it's my pleasure uh, in this occasion to share some of our recent results in uh, spin core and spin orbitor using magnetic, uh, actually ferromagnetic materials. In the first part of my talk, I will talk about the spin orbitor switching in the system tungsten cobalt erbium where uh, we report a new characteristic temperature. And in the second part, we will use this uh, ferromagnetic amorphous gadolinium iron cobalt as a efficiency source of the spin core current sorry, and cell production of spin uh, orbit torque. So let's remember uh, the symmetry of the spin hole effect. Uh, I think we all know that when we have a material as, as a heavy metal with a strong spin orbit coupling, if we inject a sharp current, we get a transversal spin current. In this case, the, uh, the polarization of this spin current is perpendicular to both to the sharp current injected and the direction of the spin current. The efficiency of this uh, sharp current to spin current conversion is called the spin hole angle and is a dimension is parameter. In our community, we have studied many materials and tried to look for engineering interface to improve this efficiency. Here in orange and green is my contribution to the field. And thinking in applications, uh, we can look for this material to uh, develop some, for example, kind of memory, um, uh, m memory, thanks to this pioneer work by Mihai Miron and co-workers, where they show that instead of using a perpendicular magnetic field to manipulate the perpendicular magnetization of this cobalt nanodot, that is uh, the standard way, now if we use an in-plane current, we can get uh, assisted with still one in-plane field, we can get similar effect we were able to manipulate this perpendicular magnetization. Soon after, it was reported many other materials in the community, uh, again, here in orange, uh, my contribution to the field, and I will talk about uh, the tungsten cobalt terbium system. Uh, so in the uh, magnetic memory, we can, uh, they developed this idea of three-terminal spin orbiter and RAM, where uh, we can have the one of the zero uh, in a non-volatile magnetic memory. And also in a collaboration between uh, SpinTech in Grenoble and Pietro Gambardella's team, they showed that actually the switching is quite fast, below one nanosecond. That is very interesting for uh, application. And I am proud to, to say that here in Nancy, we get also a record of uh, a few picoseconds, only six picoseconds to the switching of this, uh, I mean, to get the spin orbiter switching via photo switcher. You are more interesting. Uh, you can watch the recorder at uh, all 53 of this online seminary. So this is the online of my toll. As I say, in the first part, I will show this uh, system, tungsten cobalt terbium. And in the second part, I will study the, I will show our study in gadolinium iron cobalt copper as a source of uh, a strong spin current source. So we report here a new uh, characteristic temperature. Let's remember the characteristic temperature in ferromagnetic rare air transition metal alloys. So we have do, sublati do magnetic sublattices, uh, but the behavior or the dependence on temperature of each sublattice is different. As a consequence, if we follow this blue curve here, we we'll have uh, these three characteristic temperature. One, when the neck magnetization vanish, is called the magnetic compensation temperature. Another is slightly higher when the angular uh, momentum uh, is vanished, is called the angular, temper uh, angular compensation temperature. And the other is when the, the sample is no longer magnetic, but usually paramagnetic, and is called the, the is called the Curie temperature. So this is something new by 50 years in uh, amorphous ferromagnetic alloys. In our case, we study the following stack. We have three nanometer of tungsten because it's a strong spin hole effect material. 
and 3.5 nanometer of cobalt terbium alloy capped with 3 nanometer of aluminium, which is uh, oxidase and passivate. So the advantage of this amorphous ferry magnet is that it's not difficult to integrate with other systems to, uh, and while keeping the magnetization of this uh, ferry magnet alloy perpendicular to this thin plane. So we can uh, change the composition to have the terbium rich phase where the neck magnetization uh, is dominated by the terbium surrich or the cobalt rich phase where the neck magnetization is dominated by, uh, by the cobalt sublattice magnetization. And at a given point, we will compensate both and where the magnetization vanishes, and this is called the magnetization compensation point. Experimentally, we can study, for example, uh, in the following way, the determination of magnetization compensation temperature. Here, in a whole bar, we sweep the perpendicular field and we normalize the transversal voltage over the shark current to get this anomalous cold effect resistance. And here we have several cycles between 300 Kelvin and 350 Kelvin. Uh, we can see the following feature. At 300 Kelvin, we have one sign of this field induced uh, switching, and about 320 Kelvin, we see that the sign change. So this is the, the main feature to determine, for instance, the magnetic compensation temperature. We, we uh, see here, up to, it will be about 320 Kelvin. The angular compensation temperature we uh, have estimated in this world by analytical uh, expression reported by Professor Lee, Teruono, and co-workers. You can look here in, the, in, in this study. But recently also, uh, the, the same group, they report uh, the determination of angular uh, compensation temperature by domain world propagation. You are more interesting, you can also see the nice tall uh, 52 in this online uh, seminar series. So another way to, uh, to know this compensation in this case uh, point is, for example, as I say, it would change the co cobalt com uh, concentration. In here, our result of a squeeze measurement are run, uh, at 300 Kelvin. In the left, we have the coercive field, and in the right, the next saturation magnetization. And we can see that about this value 0 0.77, the next magnetization uh, down to zero, or vanish, and the coercive field, this blue square, seems to diverge. That is the typical behavior of uh, these uh, ferromagnetic alloys. And as I uh, told you, if we did a temperature dependence, we can get similar uh, feature here with the additional case that the sign of the cycle uh, change. Uh, here, the field switching polarity have opposite, uh, I mean, the, the polarity is opposite when we cross the magnetization compensation point. So, and I will exploit this uh, soon after in my, in my study. So these ferromagnetic alloys, uh, cobalt, terbium, and other uh, amorphous rare art transition metal, uh, allow us to tune the neck magnetic moment by changing either cobalt concentration or, or transition metal concentration or temperature. Now I move to the main study in this, uh, in this part, uh, is the spin orbital switching. But before that, let me show you one more time uh, here, the field induced switching. So here is the example of two, uh, I mean, uh, there are two devices patterned in whole bar, and uh, where we sweep here the perpendicular field. So this is the classical way to manipulate uh, the perpendicular magnetization. This is the sample, one is terbium rich at room temperature and the other is cobalt rich at room temperature. We can see that they have opposite uh, switching polarity, in this case, field induced switching polarity with this little current of 400 micrograms. Now, uh, instead of using the perpendicular field, we use uh, in-plane current, as shown here. And uh, we can see a nice uh, cycle here, and we get the spin orbital switching uh, of this uh, perpendicular magnetization. And we can see a sharp jump, uh, I mean, uh, at this value of uh, switching current or critical current. And when we change the, the, uh, the in-plane field, needed to still assist this spin orbital switching. When we change this sign, the switching polarity change the sign. So all the features agree with this spin orbital switching. And also that the amplitude here is the same here. So we have the 100% magnetization switching. We are not showing here, but we get this kind of cycle even with little two millitesla in plane field. And now I will show you the case of terbium rich uh, sample at room temperature. Here, so we see the cycle. We see a, 
electrical, I mean, a switching induced by this uh, pulse current. We see a sharp uh, switching here. The polarity change the sign when we change the in-plane field. So it seems that all agree also with the spin orbital switching. However, there is something that uh, is, seems not right. What is that? If we compare this cycle and this cycle, they have the same uh, switching polarity. And that is something that uh, we, I mean, unexpected. And we were arguing with our colleagues uh, about that uh, and the origin of this. One idea is uh, the joule heating, the strong joule heating that we have because now we're uh, in using a lot of uh, current. The current density is much, uh, two or three orders of magnitude, much higher here than here. So in order to clarify that, we will do the following experiment. We'll repeat this measurement, but instead of using this little current, 400 microamps, we'll change the intensity of the current with different uh, I mean, uh, the order of milliamps. And the summary of the result is shown here. We can see here in the bottom, we have uh, 5 milliamps, and we increase the current. And we can see that about 20 milliamps, the sign of this or the, the polarity of this cycle changes. So as I, I stress it, a change of the polarity means that we overcome the magnetic compensation temperature. And then we fo uh, follow the, the experiment and even uh, keep the um, magnetic property up to 34 milliamps. So at the beginning was room temperature, or we can define now cryostat temperature, the initial temperature over the device. But we now show again this switching cycle. Uh, in this case, the critical of the switching current is 24 milliamps. It corresponds to this region. So uh, above the magnetic compensation temperature. With, that, uh, with this result, so it was clear for us that the unexpected uh, switching polarity is because we start the experiment here. I mean, the cryostat temperature is here, but the actual temperature of the device during the switching is here. And we can define, I mean, uh, we know that the sample temperature is above magnetic compensation temperature. We have calculated the angular uh, compensation temperature, which is uh, slightly higher than magnetic compensation temperature. And we know the actual sam sample temperature is above this uh, three temperature. And here also, we can see that it's below the Curie temperature because here uh, still the sample is magnetic at even uh, keep uh, his uh, magnetization perpendicular to the film plane. So this is our first, uh, I mean, finding. And then we study uh, systematically at different temperature, all these areas with different composition. Here, for example, I am showing, in this case, cover 0.79. In the top panel, uh, again, is the switching cycles. But now, in addition to measure the transversal voltage, we also measure the, trans the longitudinal uh, voltage normalized by the current. That means the, the resistance of the channel. And a value of uh, the channel resistance means a value of temperature. And this is uh, here, uh, we are showing just a few uh, cycles uh, to, for seeking uh, to, to have simply this, this, uh, this figure. If we look, for example, at the orange curve here at 340 Kelvin in the cryostat, and now we follow this vertical uh, Dutchen line, we reach this in this parabolic curve uh, at this point of uh, longitudinal resistance. And now if we look, for example, and the blue cycle uh, is at 200 Kelvin, the cryosto temperature, the switching, uh, the critical current to switch increase. But now if we follow this vertical uh, blue dash line, we reach uh, the other point here in this blue parabolic behavior. But now if we look uh, at this value, those are the same. So same value of longitudinal resistance mean uh, here in this uh, red rectangle, same value of longitudinal resistance uh, in a way means the same temperature. So that we are saying is that in the switching experiment, we are, bring, uh, we are warming up our device to the given temperature, which is the same regardless the initial uh, temperature of the device. And on the other way, experimentally, we can estimate this temperature that we call it switching temperature, for example, using a little current to measure the resistance of the channel versus temperature, and in this case, uh, performing this linear, linear extrapolation. And we estimate here 488 Kelvin uh, for this particular uh, con concentration. 
on the theoretical side, uh, there, wa there is this study uh, where they already told about the cell production uh, spin current in amorphous ferry magnet driven by thermal magnets. But that I pick up here is this characteristic temperature they predict. Uh, they say that this cell production vanish when the, the system uh, have this condition. The MDT is, is zero. So in this blue curve, it will be here. I wanted, and still I want, to, to see experimentally if there is a correlation even with this switching temperature that we found experimentally and this uh, characteristic temperature they report theoretically. But so far, I, I couldn't do it. I, I filed it. Uh, I saw it was easy, but uh, actually, it's, it's very hard experimentally. The, the magnetic signal of different magnet alloy is quite uh, good. So before to summarize uh, the first part of my talk, uh, let me acknowledge all my collaborators, uh, the team at the Institute of Amor and Nancy, and our great uh, co-workers at Espin Tech in CEO Grenoble, particularly to our youngest um, student here, Taya Fang, my former PhD, and now she's back in, in Vietnam. So with that, I come to the, to the summary of this first part. So we report a spin orbital switching in this tungsten cobalt turbine system, and we obtain all uh, the switching at different temperature and composition. We get this phase diagram uh, here of the switching temperature, and we see that the switching temperature increase when we increase the cobalt composition, opposite to the magnetic uh, uh, compensation temperature and opposite to the angular compensation temperature. Even though it's not shown here, both decrease when we increase cobalt. But switching temperature and Curie temperature increase when we increase cobalt concentration. The current density is in the typical uh, range that we found in, in heavy metal ferromagnetic materials. Uh, we found out that it's been 1 and 3, 10 to 11 ampere over the square meter. And uh, we say that the role of the heating, of the Joule heating, is actually an advantage because despite the strong spin, uh, perpendicular anisotropy in this cobalt terbium alloy, uh, we, because we are heating, we reduce strongly this anisotropy, and we need only a little uh, in-plane field, even uh, down to 2 millitesla. And we check that, even though we have not reported, for example, with platinum cobalt terbium. Here, the heating effect on cobalt terbium is uh, much smaller, so we, do, uh, we don't get this, uh, the, uh, the same role of temperature in, the, in this platinum cobalt terbium system, while we are getting this advantage in this tungsten cobalt terbium system. So as I, uh, I show you here, uh, the effect of the heavy metal as a spin, co a spin uh, current source on a magnetic material. And as I say, using this amorphous alloy allows us to relative easy integrate on different structure in collaboration with uh, Professor Kang Wan teams. We get, for example, this on top of this smooth selenate compound, and we get this switching uh, current. This is the current density that we report. And uh, so the advantage of this ferromagnetic alloy is that it's not difficult to integrate with different systems. But now I want to move uh, with the second part of my talk where uh, I want to show you that we can use indeed magnetic material as an efficiency source of the spin current. For that, we choose the gadolinium iron cobalt system because uh, the strong spin orbit coupling is, uh, is bringing by the 5D electron of gadolinium. So one, again, let's remember this, the symmetry of the spin hole effect. In this heavy metal or magnetic material, we have the following. We inject a charge current, we produce along this direction the spin current with this spin polarization. And this is the efficiency. But in this study in 2015, they report that in magnetic materials, we have also a spin current production with a uh, spin polarization aligning with the magnetization of this magnetic material. With that in mind, uh, several experiments have been performed. For example, here in this uh, study by Vera Maru team, using this no local measurement, they account for not only a spin anomalous hole effect, but also they need to uh, add a spin hole effect to report the right behavior of the experimental data. And the overall efficiency, they say, is about the same of the platinum. Uh, in my knowledge, there is also in 2014, this study 
by inverse spin hole effect, spin pumping for Roman and resonance, where they report the cell uh, spin uh, hole effect in permaloid. And more recently, by, in this work by Professor uh, Xin Fang, they report, uh, they call it anomalous spin orbit tor, and they report uh, efficiency similar to platinum also in this permaloid uh, alloy. Another study in, in this uh, material, uh, other magnetic material, is this one in cobalt iron borrow. Here, uh, Satoshi Yama and co-workers report uh, overall spin anomalous hole effect about 0.14. Quite large, they use this uh, spin torque ferromagnetic resonance technique with a DC uh, modulation to see the variation of the line width. And this is the, the result. And I will use the similar, similar study here. Uh, in the last, in the recent years, also were, were more progress on the theoretical side. Here is a series of papers. This is not exhaustive. I just found out that at the end of the last year, there is another one by, by Professor Kyung Lee. And you can see, if you are interested, the recorded toll of Vivid Amin, the toll number 11 here. So just to sum up all these um, different contributions that we can uh, consider is the following. In a magnetic material, we have a spin current generation with two symmetry. One that we can coin a spin hole effect light, where the spin polarization is perpendicular, to the magnetization and to the injector charge current. And the other that we can call uh, the spin anomalous hole effect light, where in this case, the spin polarization is alignment with the magnetization of this magnetic material. As I say, we use a uh, spin torque ferromagnetic resonance, and we, this is our setup. This is a widely used technique in our community. Again, this is not exhaustive. And this is a, a picture of our device this, uh, here is our slab, and we apply in plane field at 45 degrees of the, of the slab. In addition to inject radio frequency current here, uh, we will add a DC current to look for the modulation, the so-called modulation of damping technique. In the recent years here in NC, we also report a some study based on this technique. For example, here in permaloid iridium manganese to look for the anisotropy of the chain bias or here in this highly epitaxial iron platinum system. And more recently, uh, we report the spin orbital evolution on, uh, depending on the strain on flexible mica substrate. So now I move uh, to our uh, main um, system in this, in this tool, gadolinium iron cobalt. So this is our system, it's a three-layer gadolinium iron cobalt, copper, permalloy. Six nanometer of copper, to avoid a chain or to reduce the chain between magnetization, between permaloid magnetization and gadolinium iron cobalt magnetization. That is nice here is that we can uh, we can see both uh, resonance line. This one which correspond when we may process the permaloid magnetization, and this one here which uh, correspond when we may process the gadolinium iron cobalt magnetization. The, uh, this measurement uh, I perform along with uh, David uh, Cespedes an intercity student under my supervision. Here, uh, we can see that the frequency dependence of the line width here in, uh, in orange uh, and green is the line width of this uh, gadolinium iron cobalt resonance line. And in blue is the uh, line width dependence of this uh, permaloid resonance line and allow us to estimate this magnetic damping. And that is what we will uh, uh, care about. We will focus on the modulation of this, uh, of this value in the following. Here in the middle is the frequency versus resonance field. And we can see here, following the blue data points, a, a square root behavior. So that means that uh, the same field is a easy plane. Uh, sorry, the, the, the plane field is an easy plane for the uh, permaloid magnetization. Why? If we look at the orange that data point, it came from this gadolinium iron core resonance. Uh, it's a linear behavior. This means that the, the plane of the field is a hard plane uh, for the magnetic anisotropy. Or in other words, the perpendicular direction is the easy uh, direction for gadolinium iron cobalt. So uh, you can see also that we need about 1.5 uh, kilogauss, or, or yeah, in kilogauss, let me say, 1.5 kilogauss to have the magnetization of gadolinium oil. Uh, Gadolinium iron cobalt aligned with the uh, DC applied field. And this field corresponds to the frequency in permaloid about 10 GHz. 
So in the following, we will work about 10 gigahertz in this three layer to look for the modulation of damping. That is the meaning of this, uh, I don't know if you can see, this um, vertical uh, black dashed line here. So the, the analysis has been performed. Uh, the theory was, as I say, was developed by Taniguchi and following a pioneer work by Petit, where they had this occurring in a resonant spectrum, and they show this uh, analytical expression to quantify the anomalous spin hole effect efficiency. And actually, it's quite the same that we find for heavy metal and spin hole effect materials. And here, a summary of, of our main results. So in this three layer at this different frequency, we can see a nice modulation of the line width uh, between 1 and 13 gigahertz. And uh, if we uh, compute the efficiency, we analyze that, we get this value. Those are actually big numbers, 0.7, and another sample, 0.8. So we have double checked it and checked it many times in different devices, in different samples and buffer, and calculation and so on. And the numbers are, are quite confident. So we got this quite huge, giant overall efficiency in this gadolinium iron cobalt copper. And in, in my opinion, I think it's the highest charge spin current conversion uh, effic efficiency reported so far, of course, using similar method. One way to, to get more confidence on this result is looking for control system of another uh, studies. For example, in permanent copper, see here we see the, the HTFMR scan, but here we can uh, not see any modulation of damping. But of course, this is copper is not expected uh, an effect here. And then another system that uh, we believe convinces us and also you more is if we study platinum, a very well-known uh, spin hole effect material. And here I show you again in, in the left our result of gadolinium iron cobalt copper. And here in the right, you have platinum, spin hole effect material, copper, and permalloy. And we can see here also a nice, a nice modulation of damping of this, uh, this three layer. But if we quantify, we got this number about 0.03, uh, 20 or 25 times much smaller than in gadolinium iron cobalt copper. So thus, uh, confirm our results, our huge or giant efficiency in gadolinium iron cobalt. And I can sum up this first part of this uh, of this gallium iron cobalt study. So we get an overall eff effective efficiency of 0.75. As I uh, stressed, we have both symmetry: spin anomalous hole effect light and spin hole effect light. Now, some question uh, still that we have is: all come from BAL, or there is some interface contribution of Rajva interface? And this question is because. Uh, gadolinium has been reported to have a magnetic, uh, to be a magnetic Rashba interface. With that, uh, I mean, let's remember that this is a typical cartoon in a metallic Rashba uh, system, the splitting and surface. Uh, we have a sudban splitting depending on the spin along the K moment. But in magnetic system, because in addition to this, we have a vertical shift, we have something like that. No concentric uh, Fermi uh, contours. And, uh, but let's, let's see the theoretical and experimental results. So here in this study, they report that gadolinium and also gadolinium on site uh, show this rush by splitting and also confirmed by theory. So with that in mind, we wanted to know uh, what is the symmetry of the contribution uh, in, in this uh, uh, magnetic rush by interface. There is a pioneer work in 2008 by Aurelian Manchon and Shang, uh, Shufen Shang but they uh, calculate the spin accumulation when magnetization is in plane for a magnetic surface. And now for this work, uh, Professor Shufen Shang and his student Ping Tang uh, enhanced this work by calculating for any direction of magnetization. And this is our result here. So we have this two symmetry. On one side, uh, I mean, the first term uh, is the spin, is, uh, have a spin hole effect symmetry, while the second one, uh, proportional to the magnetization of the sample have the spin anomalous hole effect symmetry. Uh, here, we will focus now and study the, the torque of this, uh, of this system. 
I guess you also know that the torque can be expressed by effective field who drive this torque, call it the field light torque and the damping light torque. Uh, so the will focus more is in the damping light torque and analysis of this. So as I say, this, we have those, uh, these two symmetry. The second one cannot uh, generate any cell torque because the spin polarization is aligning with the magnetization of the magnetic layer. And the first one may exert cell torque if we have the right condition, which is if we somehow absorb it outside the spin current emitted from this uh, magnetic material. So with that in mind, we can uh, look at this uh, carton here. We can think about some ways to, to exploit the cell induced spin orbital in magnetic materials from both, from uh, bulk or, and or interface. So as I say, when we get a sharp current in a magnetic uh, layer having perpendicular magnetization, we have both uh, two symmetries. One is the spin anomalous Hall effect light, where here we don't have cell torque, and here we may have a cell torque only if we absorb outside this spin current. One way to get this is if we see here, for example, a good or efficiency spin thing, right? Uh, uh, for example, a layer with a strong resistivity or where the thickness is above uh, the spin diffusion length of this material. So this is our condition to exploit or to, uh, to get evidence of this cell tor by these magnetic materials. Uh, indeed, in, in the last year, in, in 2019, there was uh, other example of cell tor. For example, this, again, this is not exhaustive. Uh, for example, here in iron platinum, in these two teams, uh, I, I write down here the, the stacking I couldn't find in the capping here. In these in this two studies, they report the spin orbital switching in, they say, a single iron platinum. And here in cobalt albion system, uh, here they report the switching. Here they report not the switching, but the uh, free light and damping light torque by second harmonic technique. Also, for example, here, uh, another example in nickel iron permaloy in the study of uh, Professor Shin Fang, here where they use STFMR also. And uh, in Grenoble, they report, uh, they study temperature dependent by inverse spin hole effect spin pumping on this permaloy uh, with a uh, buffer and capping in different material, oxide, heavy metals, uh, copper, and different study. In all this, they report uh, either switching of a damping light tor or uh, in cell uh, spin hole effect. So in the following, I will look in our system of linear cobalt copper to fulfill the condition of having a good spin scene. Uh, for that, we will use also second harmonic technique, another, uh, I think, uh, widely uh, used technique. Again, this is not exhaustive, just uh, uh, some example of literature. And we pattern our device now in whole bar, and we uh, study this uh, when we apply the in-plane field either parallel to the core, uh, to the current or perpendicular to the current. This is the so-called damping light configuration and field light configuration. And we inject the AC current. We measure the signal at the fundamental frequency and at the second one. And this is the feature in the damping light configuration. We have the same slope uh, for different initial state of perpendicular magnetization. While in the field light uh, configuration, the slope here is opposite. To quantify this damping light of field light uh, effective field, is nothing else than the uh, slope of this uh, second harmonic signal over the coefficient of this parabolic curve here in the first harmonic signal. So uh, here I intentionally show what you know cobalt copper, we have a very weak uh, slope, a weak signal here. We are now a good spin thing, uh, then we will increase we may increase this uh, this effect. And good spin seeds are, for example, heavy metal. So here I summarize our results of the field line in these three systems. Aluminum iron cobalt copper, this uh, black and core with the uh, orange line, uh, then capping with tantalum, this star, or capping with platinum, this uh, blue square here. So we can see here that uh, we have sizable field light tor in this aluminum iron cobalt Cobalt, sorry, aluminum, iron, cobalt, copper bilayer. 
And also we believe that it's come from the top interface uh, because when we replace copper by another material like titanium, the field light uh, field change the sign. Uh, we have uh, a small additional effect of tantalium and also a small additional effect of a spin hole effect of platinum because uh, if we normalize by the current density on platinum, actually this, uh, this curve uh, close to the orange one. So this is the, the analysis of the free light tour, but we want to discuss more than the damping light because uh, that is that will drive a spin orbitor switching, for example. And here are our results in these uh, same samples. So in orange, as I say, we have a weak uh, signal with effect is no uh, or almost nothing damping light with only copper because we don't reach the condition to exploit the cell tor. Uh, so the spin current emitting by gallium iron cobalt is not absorbed but reflected. But if we see here the case of tantalum and platinum, when we have uh, tantalum, uh, there is uh, a little increase, post a change in sign, but the, it's still small, the, the signal here. While when we have platinum, this uh, damping light field against current density in gallium iron cobalt increase uh, strongly in these blue data points. So that we have here is the following. In addition to the cell tor of, uh, of this gallium iron cobalt, we have also, of course, the contribution of the spin hole effect of platinum and in the case of uh, tantalum, we have the subtraction of the spin hole effect of tantalum. Uh, in the following, I will focus in the analysis of uh, platinum, and, and we can do the same way for tantalum. So here we have the total damping light tor in this three layer, and we say this, that we have the addition of cell tor of gallium iron cobalt and the spin hole effect uh, of uh, platinum. We can, we can write down this uh, following this simple expression. So experimentally, we know the total damping light in this three layer. We want to know, or we want to quantify the damping light of this cell tor when we have platinum. And we need to know what is the contribution of the spin hole effect of platinum here. Uh, but we can take advantage of our formal study in this three layer with platinum copper permaloid, where here we have uh, compute the spin hole angle. So using these relationships that give us the ratio of the damping light tor of over the current density, but now we normalize by the current density in gallium iron cobalt, we get this number. So now we have all, all this uh, and this, and we can compute the cell tor contribution in this uh, gallium iron cobalt copper when we have a platinum spin sin. And this number is also, uh, is, I mean, it's a large number, uh, is in the order of the best heavy metal at room temperature. If we look, for example, some review like by William Manchon about the spin orbitor in, in uh, yes, about the spin orbitor. So here uh, I stress again that this contribution is due to only spin hole effect light contribution, right? Because it's the only that can uh, assist the cell tor. So now we can look again at this result in this uh, three layer gallium iron cobalt copper platinum. And that we say is that in the uh, green uh, area, we have the cell uh, torque contribution. And in the gray area, we have the platinum, uh, the spin hole effect of platinum contribution. Uh, and this red line here is the, the value that we just uh, compute about close to minus 6, 10 to minus 10. This damping light torque uh, normalized by the current density of uh, in gadolinium iron cobalt. So it means here, for example, this red arrow for a given Current density, current density here, this red arrow stands from the contribution of the cell tor, and the blue one stands from the contribution of the spin hole effect of platinum. Uh, that is our one of our main message. Our main message here. In addition, we can further analyze uh, our results, and because we have quantified this cell tor contribution, the damping light over the current density. Uh, using again this uh, very well uh, new approximation, we can compute this efficiency that uh, is an effective uh, uh, kind of a spin hole effect in gadolinium iron cobalt. But once again, this is only due to the spin hole effect light symmetry. And we can compare this with uh, the value, the overall effective we have found here in 
in the Union Iron Cobalt in the modulation and damping experiment. And we, we have both contribution. So both are quite a uh, quite large number. So the, there is a still some question open. So all come from BAL, there is an interface contribution. As I say, we believe that mostly it came from interface. We have a study uh, systematically by uh, EDS steam analysis, the composition gradient in our amorphous gallium iron cobalt, and it's quite small. And we are still some, some other studies in, in progress, but so far we believe that the most contribution come from, from interface, but we cannot neglect contribution from the bulk in gallium iron cobalt in this, uh, in this system. Before to come to the end of my, of my talk, let me say thanks again to my co-workers, uh, the, all the great team at the Institute of Namor in Nancy, uh, our uh, collaboration at the uh, uh, Unitemix Deficit in Stales, uh, Davide, Van Sam, Cross, and Albert, and Professor Xu Feng Shang and his student Ping Tang in Arizona, and Christoph uh, in uh, Singapore. And I would like to uh, I would like to say a special thanks to our youngest student of uh, internship student, David Cespedes and Aldo Arriola, internship student from uh, Universidad Nacional de Ingeniería uh, in Peru. They spent a few months uh, with us uh, under my supervision, and I think they did a very fruitful work. And also Eloís Damas, uh, who joined at the beginning of last year, performed a master, and now uh, she just started a PhD under the supervision of Sebastián Petit and myself. With that, I come to my last slide. So that I want to uh, uh, highlight in the second part of my talk is that we report a kind of giant effective overall efficiency in this gallium iron cobalt copper. It's about 0.75, which we have compared against 0.03 in platinum. And uh, moreover, we can uh, disentangle the symmetry of this contribution, the spin anomalous Hall effect light and the spin uh, Hall effect light by combination of a modulation of damping experiment and second harmonic technique. So we report large third tor, phi light, and damping light, but we stress that this spin hole effect light may exert third tor only if right condition for no re spin current reflection are matched. So, and of course we have several uh, perspective, uh, I mean, uh, ideas, and I would be glad to discuss uh, uh, with you about that. I mean, uh, one of these is uh, looking for a uh, non-magnetic heavy metal spin orbital switching for, for example, scanning motion. It's also very well known that this uh, gallium iron cobalt uh, produce uh, scarmions in, uh, so if we got this free of heavy metal, that would be, I think, a, a great, uh, a great result, a breakdown result. So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention, and I will be very glad to respond, uh, to reply to your answer. Thank you very much for this uh, interesting talk. So this talk is open for questions. If you have questions on Zoom, please uh, use the raise hand option. If you cannot find that, you can always send me a private uh, chat message. And if you're watching this online on Twitch, you can type your questions in the chat box. I will read it to, for you. Okay, let's see if we have any questions for now. I have a quite a few questions uh, if there's no... Oh, Kirill, do you want to ask the first question? Yeah, thanks. Uh, so uh, to start with, I have a question about the first part of your talk. So you, you were talking about the switching temperature. Right. I'm trying to understand what it means. So, I mean, suppose you were sitting isothermally at that temperature, you would still have a switching current, right? So I have trouble understanding how... Uh, do you mean in tungsten cobalt terbium or? Yeah, the, the, the first part, uh, you, you, you were showing that the switching occurs at the same temperature. Here. Yeah, right. you have different currents uh, um, on those curves. So why, 
Why is it just the temperature, but not the current density that matters? Uh, that, okay, or we, I mean, if you look here at the, the bottom panel, I know you see my mouse here. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, you look at the bottom panel, uh, this is the longitudinal resistance, for example, the blue curve and the orange curve. And uh, at the switching current, I mean, switching current are different at different uh, cryos of temperature, right? But that we measure in the bottom is the, the channel resistance. So the channel resistance in, in a way is a, a temperature sensor. So that we find out here is that for different switching current here, we bring the device to the same resistance, uh, channel resistance. So that means we bring the device to the same temperature. Yeah, I understand that. But I mean, physically, why is it so? Um, ah, okay. That, that's is, uh, that's is, I mean, those are experimental uh, experimental fact. This is our experimental finding, and that's because I uh, now I I'm not sure it, it is this, but uh, you in the, in the right uh, uh, part of my slide, there is this theoretical paper where they already told about the cell spin current production in this uh, ferrimagnet and driving by thermal magnets. So. They say that this uh, cell spin current production is cancelled out at this temperature. I mean, when, when this have this condition. So I don't know uh, it, is this that, but one uh, hypothesis could be that uh, where uh, we have both contribution one a spin hole effect on tungsten and other this one and this spin orbital become effective here when we banish the cell production in cobalt thermium. So the spin orbital of tungsten become uh, highly effective. So, but I, I mean, that experimentally, I want to check it out, but uh, it is, so far it's quite difficult because the magnetic signal of uh, this uh, magnetic alloy, ferry magnet alloy is, is very weak. Okay. Okay, uh, we have a second question from Eric, Eric Montoya. Please go ahead with your question. Hi, Carlos, thank you for this nice talk. Um, actually, just this slide's perfect as well. So when you are, you have this spin torque plus this kind of this thermal effect causing the switching in your uh, current pulse uh, carrying portion of the this, this hall cross, um, the, the hall arms, so the, the small wires that you're measuring in almost hall effect, is there any artifact, because uh, they, those shouldn't be switching because the, the temperature there should be much lower. There shouldn't be current densities for switching. Um, does, is there some sort of artifacts introduced by having some sort of weird domain wall, domain state where the uh, current carrying our, uh, segment might be in a different magnetic state than say your um, anomalous hall detection material? We, we have looked at in some devices uh, on their care microscope and of course, all this spin orbital is nucleation plus domain wall propagation. But uh, we have checked this in so many different devices and different batches, different wafer. We found similar results. Sometimes we found artifacts when we, uh, like random, we find out, for example, zero field switching. We are quite excited, but then when we check it, it's, I mean, it's done. There is no reproducible fault in, uh, in other devices. But here, this is, uh, uh, I think I'm confident of the results. And as I say, for example, we have checked it with platinum cobalt thermium. In platinum cobalt thermium, we have not, the, uh, we, we don't have the same heating effect. So we don't have this, uh, uh, I mean, we observe the expected polarity in thermium rich uh, samples. So it means that we're not heating too much, where we don't bring the device above the magnetic compensation temperature in platinum cobalt bilayer when we're in the thermium, uh, thermium rich uh, phase. Okay, thank you. I guess to, to sort of follow up, since you have the, the Kerr microscopy, that's great. Um, so say you switch the uh, the area you want to switch, and then the what what is what that's and then you turn off the current pulse. What is the now the ground state, or or what what is the state of the the hall cross then? The state of the hall. I mean, we we here. I mean, this. I don't know here. I get, I catch well your question, but. This is, for example, down, and this is up for, for the state of the whole cross. So you yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. So well, I'm saying, so I'm imagining that your the the cross arms aren't switching, right? Or yeah. are? 
So then you have some state that's switched right next to a state that's not switched. Is there some, and then you remove current, what happens, I guess is the question. I'm not sure I understood what, what, what the question, I mean. Uh, okay, okay, that, that, that's okay. I'll, if someone else has another question. Oh yeah, we can discuss later. Okay. We, can we can continue the discussion after this uh, session. Uh, so uh, Junwen Xu, please uh, go ahead with your question. Thank you for your nice talk. I have a question on your second part, uh, that is cobalt-gadolinium copper permaloid stack. You said in the spin anomalous Hall effect, the magnetization, uh, the spin polarization is aligned with the magnetization of cobalt-gadolinium layer. And uh, if you apply an external field, then both co uh, both gadolinium and iron cobalt layer and a permaloid layer will have the same magnetization direction, then which which is also the same polarization direction, then the cross product will give zero. So I, I'm wondering how you calculate the, the field. Well, that, that talk. Right, same for the question. Uh, it's a, a good question. So in the static, let's say a state, you, we apply this strong in-plane field is right about uh, 10 gigahertz, about two kilogauss, let's say, both magnetization gadolinium iron cobalt and permaloid, they are aligning and they are parallel. Mm -hmm. But now we look at the resonance of permaloid. That means the magnetization of, of gadolinium iron cobalt is well aligned with the in-plane field, but we have a, the dynamic of permaloid. So mm -hmm. permaloid is not a static, but dynamic. I see, I see. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Uh, do you have other question? Check on Twitch. No, we don't have question on Twitch. Okay, I can ask one uh, more question. So mm -hmm. to extrapolate the uh, the the self spin other torque contribution or the uh, the the spin hole uh, part, you compare with the control sample of platinum copper pomeroy, and uh, and you use the kind of assuming the same spin hole angle and calculate that uh, spin orbit torque. So here's uh, two questions. First of all, you're using permaloid as the control sample, assuming permaloid doesn't have that spin orbit, the self spin torque. And two is uh, the spin orbit torque, uh, the formula should depend on the interfacial spin mixing conductance. So therefore, the effective spin hole angle may not be the same for platinum copper pomeloy and uh, platinum copper iron gadolinium cobalt. I I agree uh, with that. I mean, we have discussed that, uh, but uh, so far, I mean, this is one way where we have computed that, and he, we did that with tantalum. In the case, unfortunately, we didn't measure tantalum, but we can uh, take one value of, from literature and we find similar similar uh, results. Or we can do the other way around. Uh, we can consider also the, uh, the ratio of tantalum and platinum. And, and we uh, then we find out uh, this value for uh, for platinum in gadolinium iron cobalt, copper, platinum, three layer. So that uh, agree very well with the, the first result. So that's because finally we choose to, to show this way. Uh, but I agree with you that here uh, we have this copper permalo interface, but actually here we compare the overall with the uh, gallium iron cobalt copper permalo. And now we have another, another interface. Thank you. Um, do we have other question? Let's see. Uh, Dangwook, please uh, go ahead with your question. Uh, yes, uh, thanks a lot for a nice talk. Uh, I have a question about the first part uh, where you have shown the, the role of joule heating in the switching of uh, these 4F and 5D elements. So my question is basically that when you change the temperature and there will also be a change of angular momentum as well as magnetic moments. So, and I always thought when it comes to dynamics of the magnetization, angular momentum actually plays a more critical role because you know the spin transfer is always the conservation of the angular momentum. So I, 
I mean, from your data, I'm fully convinced that uh, actually it is well explained by the joule heating, but have you also considered whether across the temperature, if the sign of the angular momentum changes, then will there be any difference in the, I don't know, in the interpretation of the data? I don't know uh, actually if I raised the question in a proper way. Yeah, I will be, that will be, for example, my, my first, uh, how do you say, uh, maybe, the first conclusion we may draw at that time, if in the phase diagram, if we will find out that this, that we call in switching temperature, follow the magnetic compensation temperature. But okay. actually, of the trend is the opposite. So we, we have compute, it's not showing here, but, but in this study, we have estimated the angular compensation temperature in, in the system. And also, I mean, it's parallel to the magnetization compensation temperature, right? But yeah. this, that we so call it switching temperature, have different uh, behavior. So uh, other okay. ways, I will be, yeah, that, I, will, I think we will be close to this history with, with that. But uh, mm -hmm. no, so far, still we have this open question. What, uh, okay, so the but, trend but, is. But I think, I mean, it's well about both. The switching temperature is well about magnetic compensation temperature, and it's not shown here, sorry, but also angular compensation temperature. Okay. Yeah, I, I will have a look at more uh, de in detail about your paper. Yeah, thanks a lot for your Thank answer. You. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it looks like we don't have uh, Eric Montoya. I think Eric was uh, asked the earlier question. He didn't uh, lower her, his hand. Right. <laughs> yeah. I want to thank the, uh, the speaker again. I want to thank all of you for participating.